Well, good morning. Welcome to Debbie's Back Porch. So glad to have you with us. Well, I'm canning today. And I think what I canned is going to be unique to most of you guys out there. But, you know, if you follow my channel, you know me well enough to know by now that if I'm canning something, I'm going to can it by the rules. The safety rules. Because, you know, I think it's kind of irresponsible to put stuff in a jar to feed your family that you don't know is safe. So while this canning project may be a little bit different to you, I have checked all the safety rules and I'm going to share those with you as we go. So while this may look to you like hamburger patties in a jar, I'm calling it Salisbury Steak because I've done a couple things to enhance the flavor to make this just a little bit different than your normal loose canned ground beef. Before we get started, please give us a thumbs up if you like our videos and subscribe. Click the little bell icon in the top right corner and you'll get notices when I post new videos. Let's get canning. Now, I've been hoarding ground beef. Not really hoarding. I've been accumulating ground beef. And this is some of my accumulation. I have two pounds here that my neighbor gave me because his neighbor had a grass-fed beef and he shared some of the ground beef. And I found some ground sirloin on sale. And then some of it's just regular, I don't know, 70-30. has a little fat in it. Anyway, I got up to about five pounds, a little over five pounds, and decided that that was enough for a canning project. Now, in this little bowl here, I have a tablespoonful of onion powder, tablespoonful of garlic powder, tablespoonful of salt. And I'm going to mix that in thoroughly with this ground beef. Now, safety rule here, you can add dry ground spices to your canning projects. Now let me be clear, that doesn't mean dried minced garlic. That doesn't mean fresh garlic. It doesn't mean you can grind up some onions and add. This is dry ground spices only. And you want to have a light hand with that. A tablespoonful of any of these things with five pounds of ground beef is a light hand because canning can intensify the flavors it can change them a little bit but i've done this before so i know this is going to be fine and taste good so i have here a wide mouth canning ring i'm going to form this ground beef into patties and i want to use a mold that will ensure uh, they will fit in a wide mouth canning jar. So I'm going to make these patties four ounces each. And just for reference, four ounces is sort of a standard hamburger size uh, quarter pounder. And I'm going to make these kind of thick. So four ounces um, molded into the shape of the canning jar ring is going to be a pretty thick patty. In the info section when I'm done, I'm going to put a link to the National Center for Home Food Preservation's directions for canning ground and chopped meat. And it will tell you that, it can, that you can form those into patties or balls or you can can it loosely. If you form it into patties or balls, the directions say to brown it lightly. Or you can saute it loosely. You cannot safely can raw ground beef. You need to cook it first. And just to be honest, to me, sauteing it loosely and putting it in a jar, I find kind of limiting. and I kind of don't like the texture very much. Many people do, and it's okay, but I, I prefer the meat formed into patties. And by the way, you can can sausage this way too. So here's what I'm doing. I'm going to pack this tightly. I don't want it to come apart. I want it to be firm patties when I'm done. 
And so I'm using this ring to pack this tightly to make sure there's no gaps in it and to give me a, a nice uniform size. So I've measured out enough to make a couple to get started. I'm going to do this in batches of four. And let me emphasize this. When working with large quantities of meat or many other things, vegetables, whatever, you don't want to leave them out of the refrigerator for more than two hours cumulatively and on a hot day, and I would say in a hot kitchen, more than one hour. Now that's raw or cooked. You don't want to leave this food, meat, vegetables, whatever, out at kitchen temperature for more than about an hour. So I'm going to be in and out of my refrigerator. I'll make enough to get started. I'll stick the meat back in the refrigerator. And then while the first ones are cooking, I'll make some more. So just however you work it in your kitchen, you just don't want to leave the meat out in a hot kitchen for more than about an hour. So I'm going to continue to work here, forming these four ounce patties, and I'll meet you at the stove. Now I have a 10 inch Wagner here, and I have just rubbed the pan with some oil. You want to avoid as much fat as possible when canning meat, but in order to cook this hamburger, I need to have just a little bit of oil. And we'll pat it off when we're done, but I don't want it sticking to the pan so badly. So there's just a light coating of oil on this pan. I have the pan on about medium high heat, and I'm going to put these steaks, burgers, patties, whatever we want to call them. I'm going to call them steak patties from now on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cook these long enough to get some browning on both sides. I'm not going to cook them done. And just to show you what I've done over here, I've measured out the rest of the meat into four ounce se uh, sections and I'm putting it in the fridge. So I'm letting these brown a little bit. I could have gotten four in this pan. I don't know why I didn't. But when they start to sizzle, I'm going to turn them over. And that's actually probably not brown enough. People get very confused with the meat directions because it may say two-thirds done. Um, it's hard to know. This recipe is, or these directions are easier because they say lightly brown the meat. That does not mean cook it done. Just lightly brown it. And the browning, searing it, sort of helps it stay together through the canning process, but it also adds some flavor. And I'm going to do a little time lapse here because, you know, watching meat cook is like watching paint dry. I'll be right back. So when you get about this much browning, we're going to take these out. And I've got a little rack over here over a paper towel to drain it. Now, when you're canning meat, you want to get as much of the fat out as you can. The very nature of meat means you'll never get every single bit of the fat out. And you can see by this pan that this is really lean ground beef. So it may seem counterintuitive to you, but I'm going to add just a tiny bit of oil as we go along. And then I'm going to pet that oil off uh, after I get them cooked. And this is kind of a hands-on thing because I'm going to be cooking here for a little while. But I'll take a paper towel and I'm going to pat these dry. When I get them patted dry, I'm going to put them in a bowl and I will stick that bowl in the refrigerator between batches. Again, no more than one hour in a hot kitchen, cumulatively, do you want the meat to be out of refrigeration. Now just a note here, if I were canning loose ground beef, sauteed, I would put it all in a colander and rinse it under hot running water. 
I don't want to rinse these and I can get most of the fat off patting it dry with a paper towel but I'd like to hold on to that browning flavor and so I'm just not going to rinse them. I'm going to do this paper towel method instead. So you see I've got my bowl over here and as I dry them off I'll transfer them to the bowl back to the refrigerator. I think you've seen enough to get an idea of what's happening here. I'll be back. So this is the last of the burgers and yes I kind of have a mess over here because I'm patting this meat dry as I go. When I get this last bunch done I'm going to put them all in the bowl, cover the bowl, put it in the fridge. Then I will actually be back tomorrow morning to finish these up. And here we are. It's tomorrow morning. Yes, I can't always do a large project without breaking it up. So I usually try to show you where you can break it up. So I've got all my canning gear together here. And I'm going to, that's a little vinegar there. I'm going to show you another way that I change the flavor profile on this. This is a quart of beef broth in the pan and this is a quart of balls vegetable stock. I'm gonna pause here for just a minute and explain to you what I'm doing and why it's safe. I wanted to change the pro flavor profile of this beef and I wanted to do it only in a safe way and you see me struggling here with my tattler lid to open it. It's really not that hard. I'm just reaching around a camera. So I contacted National Center for Home Food Preservation and asked may I safely use vegetable broth, freshly made vegetable broth, to can meat. The answer was that because they do not know the pH of the vegetable broth, they can't say one way or another. So I then contacted Ball and my question was, is your vegetable stock safe to substitute for meat broth in canning meat? And their answer was, if you do the preparation fully and can the vegetable broth, the vegetable stock, then it would be safe to substitute for meat broth in a recipe for canning meat. So that's what I've done here. So using the vegetable broth to can these meat patties, steak burgers, I'm calling them steak patties, this is going to bring the tomato, onion, garlic flavor to the whole thing. So that's what makes this different. And this is why I'm confident that we followed all the safety rules here. So I'm going to put this broth on the stove and heat it up and then we'll can our steak patties. So here are the patties except for two that I had for dinner last night. I have water in my canner heating up on a low heat. I have my jars over here with hot water. I have all my lids and rings together and we'll just get started. You know I'm always so crowded when I'm doing canning videos because I don't have a lot of counter space but um, you know we make the best of what we have. So I'm pouring the hot water out of a jar and I'm going to put the patties in and I'm putting them in cold because I'm going to add really hot broth and we want to have hot broth, hot canner, hot jars. We want to match that all up. So these are going in and you know these are pure jars. P-U-R jars. They're a fairly new brand and I got wide mouth in order to do this but I didn't realize how they were shaped and ball wide mouth jars are shaped differently. They're the same all the way down. So I can get three in here. I'm going to do some jars with three and some jars with two. I'm pretty sure you could put six in a wide mouth quart jar. So I'm filling this up with the broth mixture up to a one inch head space. Now warning warning these are difficult to debubble. 
I have a skewer here that I'm going to try to use. I've also got a little spatula. But the reason they're difficult to debubble is because you don't want to break up your hamburger patty. You want to try to keep it whole and solid. And there's not a lot of room in there. But you have to debubble as much as you can. And you see this spatula, it's it's not really working very well. So um, I'm going to use that skewer and just just to get as many of the bubbles out as I can. Now this meat, you know, is not done. It's maybe two-thirds done. And so there may still be some a little bit of air in the meat, but there won't be much. So I'm going to adjust. I got the bubbles out. I'm going to adjust. And then, as always, I'm going to take a paper towel and clean the rim of any um, fat or any debris from the meat. And you always want to do that, but you want to do it especially carefully when you're canning meat because of the fat. You just can never get rid of all the fat. So these are the new Pure Lids, P-U-R, Pure. Uh, this is a new, fairly new brand. And Pure Lids and Rings. I always turn my rings backward a little bit to make sure that they seat properly. If you turn them backwards, they'll eventually just flip down. Finger tight. Finger tight means with your fingers not with your fist, into the canner. So I'm going to do just one more. Poured the hot water out, and I'm going to put my patties in. Just sort of fit them piecemeal. You need smaller ones on the bottom with these pure jars, but with if you have ball jars, you won't, you won't have to mix and match like that. They'll all fit right in. Now just a canning note here. I have three inches of water in my canner and I have the heat on but I have it on low. I have my broth hot but I don't have it boiling. So you're go And my jars were in really hot water. So your goal here is to match the temperature of the broth and the canner and the jars. That's why you don't see me filling up all the jars and then putting lids on all the jars, and then putting all the jars in the canner. I'm doing them one at a time so I can hold my jars in the hot water. And I'm debubbling. You know, this, this patty might stick up just a tiny little bit above the one inch mark. Not much. And that would be okay if it were up just a tiny little bit. But you want your broth at the one inch headspace mark. The headspace is pretty important when doing meat. Well, it's pretty important when canning anything. You want to follow the headspace directions. No matter what kind of lids you're using, you want to follow the headspace directions. Because that headspace, the proper headspace, is what pulls the vacuum and holds your lid down. So, we're going to Turn it backwards just a little bit till it seats. Uh, yeah, that wasn't going right. You see, there's a damaged ring right there. And because they were brand new, I missed it. So, let me get another one. You know, when you're putting your rings on the jars... No, let me back up. If you're having trouble with your jars sealing... Most of the time you're going to find, if you examine, that the problem is an imperfect ring. Normally when I'm canning, you will see me clean out the inside of the ring with a little vinegar. I didn't do that because these are brand new. I just washed them. So finger tight is you turn it until the jar starts to move and then like a quarter inch more. So I've got seven in my canner in the hot water. For new canners, I want to tell you this important safety note. My canner calls for three quarts of water. 
USDA calls for two to three inches. Either one is fine. Follow your canner's directions. I could stack double stack of pints in this canner and would use the exact same amount of water. When you are pressure canning, you never want to cover your jars in water. That will prevent the heat from being high enough to properly can the food and make it safe. Okay, this is an All-American 921. We're going to lift all of these lugs up. Make sure that the lid is on straight. I'm sorry, I haven't used this canner in a long time, so I'm having to adjust my lugs here just a little bit to make sure my lid goes on properly. If you're not familiar with All-Americans, they don't have a gasket. They fit metal to metal, the lid to the, to the pot. So you will occasionally lubricate the fitting where the lid fits to the pot with petroleum jelly or lard or oil. Just something so that the metal to metal doesn't get stuck. Some people do it every time they can and I do it a couple times a year. And because I hadn't used this canner for a while, I did it right before we started. So your canner has its own closure. If you don't have an All-American, follow the directions for how you properly close it. With an All-American, you tighten it with these lugs and you do opposite sides until it's firmly tightened. When I started this, I turned my heat up to high and all I have to do now is wait for it to start to vent and I will be back at that time. And here we are. That's time lapse. By vent, I mean you have a steady plume of steam coming out of that little vent hole. And you would be able to see it if you were in the room with it. It's hard to see it on a video. But when it starts to vent, you have a steady plume of steam. Set your timer for 10 minutes. And 10 minutes is when I will be back. And by time lapse magic, I'm back. After 10 minutes, I'm going to put this weight on. I am just under a thousand feet. And this is a weighted gauge canner. It does have a dial, but it's a weighted gauge canner. So I am using 10 pounds and, and by time lapse magic, it is now rattling and I just want you to see how it begins to rattle. When it starts to rattle, I will set the timer for 75 minutes, which is the amount of time I need to can meat in pints. And I'm going to turn my heat down now. To what I call the sweet spot. The sweet spot is the lowest possible temperature that will maintain the proper pressure in your canner. And through years of practice I know where my sweet spot is. Uh, but if you're new to canning you probably want to do a load of water in jars just to practice finding your sweet spot. Now to help you learn to find the sweet spot on your canner, I'm just going to let you watch this for a couple of minutes and see what to expect when you hit the right temperature. If you'll notice, the little weight is just sort of riding on the steam and every once in a while, two or three times a minute, it'll give a good healthy rattle and then it'll settle back down. Now luckily I have a gauge also, so I can double check and make sure that I'm maintaining pressure. You may only have a weight, or you may only have a gauge on your canner. But on an All-American, this is the sweet spot. So when the 75 minute timer goes off, I'll turn the heat off, and I'll come back when we're at zero pressure. So I'm going to tell you something about All-American canners that nobody else will tell you. Even at zero pressure, no matter how long you wait, there's still a tiny bit of pressure left in the canner. And what I do is just touch it with um, a pot holder, very slowly allow that last little tiny bit of pressure to release. And if you 
if you don't do that, you end up with more siphoning. And it's not written anywhere, but I've had lots of All-American folks tell me they have the same issue. I have four All-American canners. They're all that way. So when I take the weighted gauge off, I wait 10 minutes. Time-lapse magic again. And then I unscrew the lugs very carefully. And bear with me here for just a minute. I'm going to get some help because... I had eye surgery two days ago and I'm not supposed to lift and strain and I've got a friend here and I'm gonna get him to finish unscrewing these for me we'll be right back I need that one to go okay come around on this side okay what do you need me to do I need you carefully because this is hot turn that that way and then pull it up and off turn towards it. towards that way like you're unscrewing it the other way. Okay, thank you. That was my friend Josh. We're going to let this sit for 10 minutes. Set your timer. Let it sit for 10 minutes before we take the jars out. And that's when I'll be back. So the reason we waited 10 minutes is because these jars are still really, really hot. But after 10 minutes, we're going to take them out. Use a jar lifter. They're still bubbling inside. And we're going to put them over here. I have a silicone cutting board with a dish towel on top. And we're just going to carefully set these out. Now, sometimes you see me can with Tatler lids. I use them pretty often. I'm using the pure lids because I'm testing these. I'll do a product review on them also. And I'll use a lot of the same footage just to show you how they work. People are confused about canning lids. Now with the shortage, what's good, what's not good, what's a waste of money, what's safe to use. With Tatler lids, when I take them out at this point, I would be tightening them down. But with other lids, like these pure lids, which have a plastisol lining, you don't touch them after you take them out. You don't tighten the rings. If they're kind of loose and floppy, you just leave them loose and floppy. We'll just put them over here. You want to put them in a draft-free area. My stove is kind of in a, a little indent, indention in my kitchen. It's between a cabinet and the refrigerator. It's not, there's no breeze that's going to come through. If you had somebody open a door and a cold breeze come through, you might have a jar pop. But we don't have that. And here we go. I'm going to leave these alone. There might have been a little bit of siphoning. There wasn't a whole lot. I've got one jar in the back where it looks like there's a good bit. It also could have been there was still a bit of air trapped in the partially cooked meat. But in any case, not a lot of siphoning. You'll see there's a little bit of fat along the top there. There always will be with meat. But this is not a lot. These look good. Leave them alone for at least 12 hours, no more than 24, and we'll be back to check. Well, good morning again. I'm going to check these, and I was anxious to check them because these are pure lids, and I've never used those before. I'm using my fingernail to tap these. You could use a spoon you should hear a sort of hollow sound and the lids don't move up and down when you press them by the way these jars are kind of greasy because as i've said there's always fat in meat and some of that fat cooked out but the lids and this one's sealed really well i'm holding just the lid and pulling up and letting the jar weight pull down and that shows a good seal and we're going to do all of them take the lid off and lift it just holding the lid portion there's that layer of fat it's not in all of them and that's really not bad for canning meat and you can see there's very little siphoning I've got one back here I'm going to show you that did siphon. You can see how 
it has come down below the one inch mark. If you have a can like that, as long as there's at least a half a jar of the product, the liquid, then it's still safe to keep it shelf stable. I, I'll tell you that I will probably use that jar, the one with the siphoning, I will use it first. Okay, now I've been through all these jars and they're all sealed nicely. Uh, I'm going to take these over to the sink and wash them in warm water. Get all the, the grease off the outside of the jar. And then with a china marker, I'm going to write the product and the date on the top before I store them. So that I always make sure I use the oldest first. For those of you that don't know, you store these in your shelf, in your cabinet, without the rings. You want to take the rings off. The rings have served their purpose. You're done with them. The jar is safely sealed and you do not need the ring. So I am very happy with the results. When I get ready to serve these, I will drain the broth off into a cup and measure it add a little if I need to, and make gravy. Then I'll put the patties in the gravy and simmer them together, and that will be a Salisbury steak dinner. And just so you know, you could do this with meatballs also. I will mention that this is ground beef. You can do it with ground pork. You cannot do it with ground chicken and turkey. Poultry has separate and different canning directions. So I hope you like this canning project and I hope you try it if you want to have steak in a jar on the shelf. Thank you for joining us on Debbie's Back Porch. See you again tomorrow.